Hello and welcome to the HSBC Abu Dhabi Championship Preview Show. BP World Tour host Mark Hill coming with you here for the Tour Junkies. Listen, I am not in familiar surroundings this week. I am in a hotel room in London, England. We're here on business for a couple of days. I've been trying to show prep in advance. And tonight went out, had a few Guinnesses, a couple of Desperado beers. And now we're sitting, hitting record at quarter past one in the morning. Um, two and a half hours sleep. So, yeah, it's it's going to be an experience. It's not going to be Jeffrey approved, but we are going to get a show put together and hopefully deliver some green screens and winners along the way. My podcast juice is my third Desperado of the evening on top of the five Guinnesses. So cheers for that side of it. And I also have some beautiful cucumber flavored water to keep me stable as the show goes on. So listen, it's one of those ones where the tour junkies, you know, have to stay on brand, you know, let's say not Jeffrey approved, but we've got to get something put together. I've been getting this show all together during the week, last couple of days, really grinding. And I am now stuck in a hotel room, which is modest to say the least, but Ticks the boxes, does the job, and now I'm going to be sitting trying to look down at an iPad screen throughout to read these beautifully composed notes that I put together. And on top of that, I then have to click the captions to try and get those to come up on the show. But listen, it all comes together in the end, and at the end of the day, if DFS is landing for you and we get some betting tickets to the window as well, it's more than we can ask for from this content. So I'm going to do my best to try and put a show together I'm just glad that it's not on YouTube Live because God knows what is going to happen in the next 45 minutes to an hour of putting this show on the road. Let me get into the course breakdown there. We are at the Yas Links in Abu Dhabi. It's a par 72, 7,425 yards. 10 par 4s, 4 par 3s, 4 par 5s, of which the 18th looks to be the signature hole. Passable in greens with water and strategically, strategically placed bunkers on a number of the holes. It's a Kyle Phillips design track. We have seen Kyle Phillips design tracks on the DP World Tour before. Some that spring to mind, Kings Barnes, which you've seen at the Alfred Dunhill Lynx Championship earlier in the year. The Grove, which hosted the British Masters a uh, couple of years back. Dundonald Lynx, PGA Sweden National. Bernardo's Golf, which was my actually my debut show for the Tour Junkies, uh, it was the Dutch Open, and we've seen a couple of players do well there and maybe may repeat this time around in Abu Dhabi. So that's uh, sort of weighted in when I'm looking at things. And the Vidura Golf and Spa Resort is another course that I have had a look at, which is Kyle Phillips designed. In terms of the Abu Dhabi Championship itself, it's been in existence for, oh, what, since 2006. But this is our first visit to the Yas Links, as I mentioned. Completely new course for the tour. It's very well received looking at some of the quotes this week from the tour professionals that have been out there. It has hosted some invitational events in the past, so we do have a little bit to look at. <clears throat> One of the other things I noticed when I was going into the details was that it does uh, does host the, well, how would we call this, the MENA Tour, which is the Middle East and North African Tour. But due to COVID, we haven't seen this track for another couple of years on that tour as well. So it's one of those ones where we're going in slightly blind. I've had a little look into the MENA data, which is obviously limited given the tour status that it holds. Um, <clears throat> from what I could find, driving distance, driving accuracy did seem to be a running theme in terms of those golfers that then progressed. One, what springs to mind is South African Kyle Barker, who picked up a win here in 2017. He's only 23 years of age this year, so that gives you a bit of a context as to the guys that are sort of cutting their teeth on that North African and Middle Eastern tour. Um, interestingly enough, he did record a T10 finish at the South African PGA Championship back in November where D Dean Burmeister picked up the W. And given that Dean Burmeister has the length off the tee, it might be a running theme here coming into this one. In terms of the weather this week, so any sort of links course as well, you're going to have the defence being the weather. And it does look like it's going to pick up as we get into the Friday. So the Thursday looks settled enough. Saturday, Sunday on the weekend looks settled enough. But Friday... Jesus, it is going to blow. Uh, 35 mile an hour gusts uh, tends to be 25 to 30 mile an hour winds in general. Something I have looked at this week is the track record on wind courses in general. So when a, the wind is picked up, you know, 15 to 20 mile an hour, and then obviously 20 mile an hour plus, uh, it is something I have had a look at. 
Elsewhere, then, in terms of the model side of things, I've looked at some links history with a key focus on the last three years in particular, seeing how those guys are going on those kind of tracks. Middle Eastern record has to be taken in. Completely new track, but you do get some sort of running theme in terms of the Middle East when we're on this swing. Who does well in Dubai, Oman, some of those other tracks that we do regularly see on the European Tour or now DP World Tour. Uh, wind, as I mentioned. Early year records is something I've tried to have a look into. So, you know, golfers coming out of the blocks cold, how do they perform, generally speaking, you know, January form, February form? Are they are they guys that get up and running, at, you know, this time of year? Or are they guys that peak sort of later in the year or during major season? So something I have bared in mind. Outside of that, travel. You know, we have a number of golfers in the field who have participated on the Asian Tour last week. Uh, we've had a, a championship in Australia as well, like some Min, Min Lu Wee. Min Wu Lee was at that. So that's something I have bear in mind as well. And uh, residency is something as well. You know, we have a number of golfers have relocated to Dubai um, and the Middle East in general. You know, if they're getting in these extra practice rounds, you have to sort of factor that into any kind of model at all. If you have any kind of looks at this course previously, the guys who have played the invitational side of things, the pro arms that are played here, uh, tend to be link specialists. I've seen that as a running trend as well. So it's definitely something I've, I've bear in mind. And, and statistically, as I said, driving distance, driving accuracy. If that wind picks up, I want an accurate golfer, someone who really shapes their shots, doesn't get too aggressive on it. Um, and that's definitely something I've factored in. So let's have a look at the top of the betting board this week. And we've got a bit of a star-studded field for the DP World Tour this week. We have Colin Morikawa at 13-2, Rory McIlroy at 13-2. Victor Hofland comes in at 10 to 1, Shane Laurie at 18 to 1, Tommy Fleetwood 22 to 1, and Tyrrell Hatton at 25 to 1. <clears throat> so, the guys that are coming in this week, obviously, a number of established names on the PGA Tour coming over here to the DP World Tour, get themselves established. Morikawa's coming off that win at the DP World Tour Championship in the Order of Merit. So, <clears throat> definitely guys that are justifiably up there in terms of the odds. I'm not going to go into every single golfer now in terms of the top of the board because there's two names on that list that I have actually back this week and I'm going to try and get you as tasty a price as I can when I get into the details on them with my betting selections. <clears throat> but in terms of the top of the betting board then, Rory McIlroy is one that I haven't got to. So strong tournament history, but obviously a different course in terms of that. So we're changing this week. Last 10 years, proverbially the bridesmaid in this competition with a string of second place and third place finishes. So in terms of DFS, he's probably one that you want to, you know, build some lineups around, but not necessarily going knee high on him. Struggling of late on link style courses did spring out when I was going into the details on it. Miscaught at the Renaissance Club, followed up by a T46 at the Open Championship. And his his major record on link style courses hasn't been great of late. A T46 at the PGA Championship, shooting five over par and shot under par only once in 2021 across 12 measured rounds of Lynx golf. So a bit of a theme there. Obviously, we've had the coaching change since a lot of those rounds were recorded. Pete Cowan is in the rearview mirror, and we're on to, you know, sort of back round to the coach that he was on before. So that's something that I've had a look at. In terms of positives for Rory McIlroy at the top of the betting board, distance off the tee I do think is going to play a factor this week. Um, his record in January, obviously... A number of these iterations of the tournament is factored into this. But in January in general, over the last five years, eight measured events in the month of January, with seven of the eight resulting in top five finishes. And obviously ended up in 2021 with a strong finish to the year, five top 20 finishes, a fourth at the BMW Championship, sixth at the DP World Tour Final, obviously fell away on the final day there, and a win at the CJ Cup as well. So Rory... Maybe it's coming into 2022 with a bit of optimism and a bit of renewed energy. How much rust are we going to see? You know, obviously, we're kind of now in terms of the nappy factor for Rory McIlroy. The baby is here. He's mixed it with the family. He's had that downtime, probably his first Christmas, I guess, as well, as a father. And trying to keep all those sort of factors in the background is something that may be bubbling for Rory. I'd like to see him sort of dust off the rust here and maybe put something together later in the month of January or into February. So Rory is not one I'm going to get to this week. I have shortlisted Colin Morikawa. I'll get into him in a second. Victor Hovland is an interesting one this week at the top of the betting board. And I think when it comes to certainly the DFS side of things, you're going to see a lot of ownership for Victor Hovland. Strong recent form of wins at the Hero Open and the Mayakoba. 
but on his seasonal reappearance, it was a T30 at the Tournament of Champions. Now, I can't put too much weight into a poor finish at the Tournament of Champions, followed up by a tournament a week or two weeks later, given that Kevin Na in 2021 finished Dunkel last at the Tournament of Champions and went on to win the Sony Open the following week. So I'm not going to wait too much into that. Victor's four wins in the PGA Tour to date have come after a week or two weeks off, showing he is capable of playing off a rest. Um, and has shown glimpses of Link's form. T12 at Royal St. George's for the Open last year, also T12 at the US Open in 2019 as an amateur, shooting four under par that day uh, to beat Jack Nicholas's 59 year record at Pebble Beach. Now, a lot of what I'm waiting in this week is not necessarily true Lynx tests. I'm looking at Lynx style courses generally. So, Pebble Beach is one that I've had a look at. Didn't fare as well in the 2021 PGA Championship at the Ocean Course at Kiwa Island. Two rounds of 75 leading to a T30, two over par score. I think Victor Hovland's going to come into this motivated, but whether he can actually deliver on it in terms of the top of the board and the price that he's at at 10 to 1, I'm going to swerve it. I think he's had his wins at the end of 2021. I think he's going to bubble up nicely and hit the majors this year. That's got to be the main focus for Victor Hovland rather than the DP World Tour side of things. So it's not one that I'm going to get to. Um, the other thing that sort of well, a couple of factors that put me off Victor Hovland when I dug into the details, the January form side of things is a negative so far in his relatively short professional career. So five events, one top five finish, averaging 49th in terms of where he's finished in the month of January including a miscut at the Abu Dhabi Championship in 2020. So, as I said, it's a different course, but I do have to factor that in mind. And so far on the records, I do see him as a wind-negative player. So if that wind really does pick up on the Friday and really starts to sort of spread the field, if you like, I think Victor's going to have to come out hot. He's going to have to put a good round together on the Thursday to try and put himself in contention on the Friday because I think he's going to have to navigate things and find it a little bit difficult at times. Since turning pro in uh, 2009 or 2019, sorry, um, he has 10 rounds in wins of 15 mile an hour plus with an average score of 72, which is okay, but he's tended to go backwards in the standings, dropping an average of 12 places when the wind picks up. That's enough for me to swerve and fade Victor Hovland this week. The other names at the top of the board then, Tommy Fleetwood, the, the note I have against Tommy Fleetwood this week is that he has top 10 equity, but not win equity. DFS is a look. Uh, maybe look at some matchups as well for Tommy Fleetwood, depending on who he's put in with. Strong links form with Tommy Fleetwood. You're going to get someone who's going to definitely be competitive. Um, less so stateside, 65th at Pebble Beach. Missed cut at the Ocean Course at Kiwa Island for the PGA Championship. But that second at Royal Port Rush and the second at the Scottish Open definitely stands out in terms of, of the recent form at Lynx courses over the last couple of years. If we are putting a premium this week on accuracy, Tommy Fleetwood is probably a negative in that department. Doesn't grade out well in terms of how he fares against the field. Uh, Shane Lowry's up there. I'm going to come to him in the betting portion. And Tyrrell Hatton has to be respected as well. Golfer renowned for his short game. Would need to be seeing a little bit more off the tee, I think, uh, in particular for Yas Lynx. Uh, mixed bag of links form in general. T2 most recently at the Abu Dhabi Championship, including a round of 64 Carnoustie. But missed cuts at the Open Championship, 18th at the Scottish Open, uh, 30th at the PGA Championship. A little bit of inconsistency overall in terms of his links form of of late. So that's something that is probably keeping me off Tyrrell Hatton a little bit, but not dissimilar to Tommy Fleetwood. I think he can certainly be competitive. I don't see anyone at the top of this board missing the cut. If he had to push me for one, it's possibly Victor Hovland. Like that, that's probably. Uh, a novel take this week. I'd say if plenty of people are on Victor, but it's one that I've definitely factored in. I'm probably going to steer away from him. So in terms of the rest of the card, so let's get into some of my best bets. So in terms of my first selection this week, it is Colin Morikawa at the top of the board. 15 to 2 best price with Bet365, William Hill and Caesars. He opened up this week at 13 to 2. He's drifted in places to 15 to 2. Generally speaking, I'd say he's still good to keep on side at the 13 to 2 price. Listen, at Lynx, he won the open. Uh Koso Boogie Free four under par 66 on the Sunday for a two-shot victory. Warmed up the week before at the Scottish Open where he was T71. Probably wouldn't see too much 
from that round at the Scottish Open to say he was going to kick on the following week and win the Open Championship. But he has gained strokes in 12 out of 16 rounds on links courses since turning pro in 2019. Composure, accuracy, dialed in with the irons of late. It's everything you want to see in what could be a relatively te- relatively difficult test this week at the Ass Links, especially when that Friday round picks up. In terms of wind as well, since turning pro, he has measured rounds of uh, 15 mile an hour or more over 14 different rounds, averaging a score of 69 and gaining on average six places in the wind over the rest of the field. So that's definitely something to keep in mind that he is the kind of golfer who ultimately is in superb form. He wants to try and get to world number one, I'm sure, before the end of the year. And in terms of the accuracy side of things, grades out second in this entire field over accuracy. So that was me looking at Data Golf in terms of their last 100 rounds, who grades out uh, in different categories, but certainly over uh, that strength, that length of time, the accuracy side of things for Colin Marcara certainly leaped out off the page. Um, and you don't even need to look at the stats, you just need to look to the eye test when it comes to Colin Morikawa to know what he's about. Composure in bags. I know the general theme of this kind of podcast and show is to steer away from the top of the board and stay, steer away from the betting favourite, but I just couldn't get away from Colin Morikawa this week. He's going to be in plenty of my DFS lineups, and on top of that, he's going to make my betting card. So 15-2 to two with uh, William Hill Caesars and Bet365, or... DraftKings Sportsbook that I priced up at the start of the show in the top of the betting board is something that would probably keep me in the mix with Colin Morikawa. Another one at the top of the betting board, and I don't tend to like to go to the top of the betting board when I'm making my selections, but can't get away from Shane Lowry. Uh, he's closed down to 18-1 to 1 with DraftKings Sportsbook, but I had a look there before I came on and still bet 365, William Hill and Caesars, points bet, Bovada still often you 22-1 to 1 on Shane Lowry. Listen, my fellow known Irishman, no, fellow known Irishman, sorry, my fellow Irishman uh, with stout Northern Irish form, may I add, at Royal Court Rush. That, that was brutal conditions that day or that weekend whenever he sealed the deal in uh, the Open Championship, I think the 148th Open Championship at Royal Court Rush. So Lowry obviously has the Lynx pedigree in the bag. He gains in seven places on average when he plays in rounds with 15 mile an hour plus wins and that's over 59 measured rounds in the last five years uh, a little bit different to those that use the uh, fantasy national side of things where you're only limited to the pga tour that i've sort of encompassed everything in from the dp world tour where we have measured win rounds as well as the data that would be collected by the likes of fantasy national and the pga tour so we're trying to broaden that a little bit so 59 rounds when it's blowing 15 mile an hour or greater for Shane Lowry, and he stands out in particular there. Uh, looking at it, obviously the Open Championship and Irish Open wins came in bad conditions. Strong links performer generally outside of the win at Royal Port Rush. He's recorded a fourth at the PGA Championship. And the Alfred Dunhill links in 2021, he also finished in fourth place. So definitely plenty to like about what he's shown most recently on links. And just a consistent cut maker on links in general, which you have to expect from guys at the top of the board. But... As you well know, whenever it comes to like, the PGA Tour, DP World Tour, we go over these names week in, week out that are at the top of the betting board and don't necessarily make the cut when it comes to the end of the tournament. So he's a consistent cut maker when it comes to the link style courses. I think the worst finish he's recorded of late was 34th at the Hinch in 2019 at the Irish Open. So generally speaking, Shane Lowry is a golfer that Ticks a lot of boxes this week. He's going to be heavily backed. He's probably going to be very popular in the DFS side of things as well, I'm sure. But yeah, between Colin Morikawa and Shane Lowry, I had to get the both of them this week. Let's look at my next selection then, which is Eric Van Rooyen at 40 to 1. And let's try not to knock over the light and camera in the background as I do this. He is 41. He still gets some 45s out there. Um I think Fangio best price of 46 to 1, probably 45 to 1 when you get to the odds conversions there. Russ, not an issue. He has been T25 at the Tournament of Champions and T20 last week at the Sony Open. I guess the jet lag aspect is something that you have to keep in mind. It's do you value having competitive rounds under your belt over the potential jet lag? I think when it comes to travel, generally speaking, at this level and this caliber of golfer, especially when they're traveling to the Middle East, it's very luxurious travel. These guys are going to be very relaxed. Yes, they've got, you know, the likes of Eric Van Rooyen this week has 
four rounds in Hawaii and then has to travel all the way to Dubai. But I think these kinds of golfers, especially Irvan Royan, who's worldwide travel and won all over the world as it stands already in his very young career, is someone that is worth keeping a look at at 40 to 1. Uh, looking at it in terms of general, uh, so accuracy numbers were very impressive last week, gaining 15% on the rest of the field in terms of driving accuracy. Several impressive finishes at wind exposed events as well. Fourth at the 2018 Irish Open, second at the Qatar Masters, second at the Trophy Hazan, the second championship as well. Two top 20 finishes at the Open Championship in the last two iterations of that. Like It's a golfer that overall has impressive links form, clearly comfortable in the wind, and just an all-round decent golfer. I think you know these Rolex type events, uh, Rolex series events, tends to be the cream of the crop that rise to the top at the end of it. We've had exceptions with Gary Stahl, for example, who has won before. This South African, though, he does impress me. The one caveat with Eric Van Royen is the temperament side of things. We've seen it last year at the 2021 US PGA Championship. I think he kicked off on the tee box marker and probably destroyed that. He's very remorseful after it in his comments. I don't think that's something that is going to affect him this year. He's got the wins under his belt, so we've got that equity on our side. I think the temperament side of things is only going to develop and mature. We've seen it with John Ram when he had these temperament issues. You look at John Ram from 2021, there's been such a progression there to bring him to the world number one. Now, I'm not saying Eric Van Royen is going to jump to world number one, but you're definitely going to see a golfer who is going to mature and progress as the year goes on. And, you know, who knows how many years he has ahead in terms of pro golf. But this week, I think there's plenty to like about Eric Van Royen. So that is my next selection at 40 to 1, which is widely available. Now, bear with me. I'm just going to try and scroll down the captions as we multitask here through this in the hotel room at well, 20 to 2 in the morning now. Let's see how we go. Uh, let's bring up my next selection. And there's another South African. So one of the themes I was looking at this week was whether I could draw anything at all from the sort of Middle Eastern North African tour event that was held here and how the top of the board golfers progressed later in their career. A lot of young golfers on that tour. How have they progressed over the last couple of years since those events? And one of the running themes seemed to be driving distance. So I think length off the tee has to be an advantage here. And there's no one better for that than Dean Burmeister. 45 to 1. Uh, really good form at the end of 2021. Kicking on from a T7 at the Alfred Dunhill Lynx Championship. Obviously, the Lynx correlation there. Burmeister won back home at the South African PGA Championship before a top six finish in the DP World Tour final. So definitely plenty to like about Dean Burmeister. He did play both events in South Africa at the end of 2021, which maybe gives him a slight edge. A lot of these golfers are returning to the course off quite a layoff in general uh, since probably the DP World Tour finals. And those that weren't lucky enough to make that have been off for you know almost closing in on two months for a lot of them. So and he at least got those competitive rounds in South Africa under his belt and hopefully can kick the ground running again this time around. Accuracy, listen, I do think you have to be an accurate golfer this week. He can probably negate that because he has the distance match with a hot putter. And that combination around a link style course may well pay dividends for Dean Burmeister. Solid rounds of Kyle Phillips designed Kingsbourne under his belt as well. When I look back at the Alfred Dunhill correlation there. His overall world ranking as well is something that's trending in the right direction. So 238th in the world in 2019, 182nd in the world in 2020 before finishing in 2021, 67th in the world. So he's only trending in one way. This looks to be the year where Dean Burmeister can crack that top 50 in the world. I think he is one of the elite golfers on the DP World Tour currently, but still does not maintain PGA Tour status. I think it's only a matter of time. He has the distance. He has the putter to keep him going. And obviously, I say we want to see a little bit more improvement in the accuracy and getting that under control. You like to think these kind of golfers have been working on those traits during the off-seasons, those that are letting them down. I think accuracy can come because he has the power to over achieve at courses like this so yeah dean burmeister 45 to 1 widely available bet 365 best price at 66 to 1 that's my next selection and then we'll get into my final selection and this one here is one of those golfers where you kind of kick yourself because he was available at a much bigger price but when you record on a tuesday evening 
and DP World Tour prices come out early Monday morning, sort of UK, Ireland side of things, and then obviously trickle down into the US market. How Tong Lee has been put up by number of tipsters this week, but a triple digit price at 100 to 1, which is widely available. I'm going to have a little nibble on that as well. Listen, Ho Tong Lee had a miserable 2021. Uh, looking at it here, it was 14 consecutive missed cuts or withdrawals before he finally got it together with a T14 at the Alfred Dunhill Links. But not only that, at the Kyle Phillips design course, he shot a 64 round to open up and obviously maintained that through the weekend. Listen, when I look back at it at the time, he something that sort of went under the radar was that he had traveled back to China, played some invitational event and done fairly well. Now, it wasn't necessarily graded in the official World Golf rankings, but it gave him some confidence. I think it was a second place finish or you know, T1. He was up there anyway at the top of the board. That obviously gave him a bit of a release. He came back to the DP World Tour or the European Tour as it was then. And at the Alfred Dunhill Links Championship, despite coming off that 14 consecutive missed cuts, he was playing off a smile. There was something jovial about him, and he maintained that into the rest of the weekend. The Spanish form side of things uh, after that wasn't great, uh, but he did make the cut at the Spanish Open before finishing the year with a second-place finish at the Volvo China Open. Again, if we look back to Sony Open last week, hindsight is a wonderful thing, but it certainly was a golfer that took a lot of what he had in terms of competitive rounds in China to carry that into the Sony Open. And again, if we overlook the jet lag, uh, I'm sure Ho Tong Lee is very well familiar with the travel aspects of being a worldwide golfer. The Chinaman can come here and do extremely well. And, you know, second place finish at the Volvo China Open is something to, to definitely like. Uh, finish strong on the weekend there after a round of 75 on day two. So he did so show some metal and bounce back ability there. And then... You know, in terms of the link side of things, three top 20 finishes at the Irish Open in 2019, Scottish and Oman Opens in 2020, as well as shooting the 64, as I mentioned, around the Kyle Phillips designed Kingsbourne. Other recent form, T12 at the Sony Open last week, obviously. And some other factors to weigh up is that he has performed well historically in the Middle East. So 2018 Dubai Desert Classic win, uh, as well as some decent past performances on Passpilum 2 when he's playing around China and obviously in some of the coastal type tracks that do have pass with them green. So a triple digit figure around how Tong Lee, it's probably worth a nibble. Yeah, probably worth a nibble. He's going to make my betting card. And let's get in then to the DFS. But before that, I got to have a little bit of my cucumber water, you know, stabilize myself. I've, I've managed to, to make it through probably just over half of the show. And um, yeah. It, it's getting on a little bit tired and everything else, but we're going to try and get the rest of this show in the bag. DFS picks coming up next, and we're going to look at the 9K and above range. I'm not going to labor the part, part uh, labor the point too much, but Colin Morikawa, 10,800. Shane Laurie at 9,900. Eric Van Royen at 9,200. If you didn't catch the betting portion of the show, I've obviously gone into a bit of detail as to why I like those three golfers in particular. My fear is going to be Victor Hovland, as I touched upon as well when I was looking at the top of the betting board. It's not a golfer I'm going to get to. That wind history really does concern me. That he tends to drop back when the wind picks up. And as I said, the, the main focus for Victor Hovland this year is going to be the majors. So I think that premium price you're playing, uh, both of the Batting wise, a 10 to 1, and obviously on the DFS side of things as well, where he's greater than a 10,500, I'm going to take him on because I, I do expect plenty of ownership. The 8K range, then. So, 8K range is one that I really tried to dig a bit deeper into this week. Uh, Ian Poulter at 8,400. So, let's look at what I have on Pulse. I just put in capital letters respected. Yes, Ian Poulter has not had the win equity over the last couple of years, but he's definitely a golfer that I want to have a look at. Six straight made cuts on link style tracks. Very competent win player when I looked at the numbers. Bit of contention, Russ, for sure. Length off the tee is definitely a slight concern, but in terms of DFS, I think he you know, can get fairly good ownership when it comes to that side of it. Um, so there is a little bit of disadvantage there with the length off the tee, but there's plenty to like about Poults when he comes into this tournament. I do think he has another win in him. This might be the style of event that sort of pushes him and gets him close. 
don't know if he's going to get across the line, but in terms of places and the 8K range in general, if you want to build out your lineup with Colin Morikawa and go 8K after that, I'm more than happy. The other side of it then, Alexander Bjork at 8,300 caught my eye. So Alexander Bjork then, strong finish to 2021, was second at the DP World Tour Finals and a fourth at the end of the CM Masters as well. Length, again, seems to be a run theme in these 8K golfers that I'm selecting for the DFS side of it, but he did make cuts, uh, tends to make the cut in Lynx events, did shoot a 69 at Kingsbarn on day two in the most difficult win conditions there that they faced at the Alfred Dunhill Lynx Championship this year. Uh, wind record in general is very, very solid. He's on average gaining eight places uh, over the last five years in wind adjusted rounds. So, yeah, there, there's li- plenty to like about Alexander Bjork. You've got the recent form, you've got the wind pedigree. He's fairly consistent link style golfer. Um, and the 8K range, that's one I'm going to get to. Nicola Hoygaard will be the other selection in the 8K range in DFS. And if I bring up as well Nicola Hoygaard, again, in capital letters, R-E-S-P-E-C-T-E-D, respected is how I am viewing Nicola Hoygaard. I don't know if we've seen the win equity on Lynx style golf courses. I think there's a little bit to make up there for him, but Let's dig into what I liked about him in general. Nothing to write home about on links, but turning since turning pro, he did record a T14 at the Alfred Dunhill. Finished 2021 very, very strongly in terms of form. Back-to-back top five finishes to break into the world's top 100. Wind record is definitely improving as he matures on tour, is what I put here as a positive sign. So his long-term uh, wind record wasn't great, if I'm honest. There was a few negatives sort of creeping in there. But when I looked at just the last four competitions in isolation, you sort of see this progression of a golfer who obviously is building in confidence in what he has done at the end of the 2021 season, recording his maiden victory as well. Uh, But he's gained now on the field in four straight events in the wind. Most recently at St Andrews on day two, the Alfred Dunhill going from 55th in the field to 7th. Uh, also shot a 65 in a relatively testing conditions at the Canary Islands Championships earlier in 2021. So, yeah, Hoygaard, I think I couldn't quite get to him in terms of the betting selections. I think he will not record the win this week, the outright win, but I definitely think he has to be respected. I think you can definitely put him into lineups. And that 8K range in general, plenty of interesting golfers in there. Lee Westwood, uh, John Catlin, JB Hansen, uh, Sam Horsfield is in there as well. So uh, I'm trying to think that I give a, a fade in the 9K range. Yes, I did, Victor Hovland. So let's get on to my fade in the 8K range there, which is Sam Horsfield himself, the good man. 8,900, I'm going to fade him at the top of the 8K range. Distance and approach is not a concern here. Around the green and accuracy is, and I'm not seeing that from Sam Horsfield in the numbers. Can't get to him with his links form either. Outside of the Vic Open in 2019, where he registered a seventh place finish, there's been a host of missed cuts. So I think when I looked at it, last three consecutive Scottish Opens, he's missed the cut, which is Lynx uh, Golf. The Irish Open, he's missed the cut. Alfred Dunhill in 2021 and the US Open as well, he's missed the cut. Just not enough for me to get the Sam Horsfield this week. He's a guy that I'm going to try and take on. Um, I, yeah, 8K range. Generally competitive, but Sam Horsfield is my fade this time around. Let's have a brief look at the 7K range because I'm keeping you guys probably longer than normal. I've touched upon Dean Burmeister at 7,600 and Hao Tung Lee at 7,200 as guys I like. I've taken a stab on my next one, and that is also at 7,200. And it's Kyrdek Afferbarnrat. And Pure Deck, you know, if I was to only look purely at his recent links forms, a big fat negative line, big red line through him, I'd say no, can't touch him. That said, he's coming off a win in his native Thailand. So we've got that very, very recent uh, competitive golf and rust sort of shaking off. Outside of that, that's bound to give him a confidence booster to try and bring some momentum into the 2022 year back on the DP World Tour. He's actually generally trending well with some notable finishes in 2021. Most notable being the T2 at the BMW PGA Championship. So, Kyrgyz, after the Barnrat, 7,200. I think it's a bit of a stab, but I'm happy to have the Barnrat on side for this tournament. Let me have another little sip of my Desperado before I get into my 7K fade. I 
think we're trying to get through this show. We're, we're trying. I'm hoping I'm not cancelled after this by the tour junkies. It was one of those ones tonight when I was sitting recording the show. I'm like, okay, not the most professional approach. Jeffrey will not approve. I just hope that I can do it for my boys, DB and Pat, put this show together in this humble surroundings and hotel room. I think I'm getting there. I'm almost there. I can finally go to sleep in a couple of, well, 20 minutes time maybe, hit the hay. But my fade is Adri Arnhaus. So Adri Arnhaus is a love-hate relationship. If any of you guys have been following, we'll call it the pilot season of the DP World Tour, or European Tour show. He's a golfer that I've been on some weeks. He's a golfer I've been off some weeks. Adri Arnhaus this week, uh, 7,400 is a golfer I'm going to be off. And it's the accuracy side of things. So I think if that win picks up, he's a golfer that can get very waylaid and, and has to sort of scramble to get himself out of trouble and then gets plenty of good looks on the greens and converts on the greens. I just don't know if he's going to get away with that from uh, what I've read into the course in terms of the comments and everything else. The greens are running very, very true. It picked up in terms of the speed side of things. I think he could do okay on that regard. But the rough is coming up. It's fairly penal. Um, don't know what he's looking like on Paspalum as well. There's not a lot of grounds, not a lot of rounds played on Paspalum, generally speaking. But the accuracy definitely kept me off Adri Arnhaus in that 7K range. And then finally, the 6K range on DFS. So I have three picks here. I'm not going to go into too much detail about them. Marcus Hilakilda at 6,900. Jazz Genawatanon at 6,900. And Joachim Lagerin at 6,800. And let's be honest, fellas. If I'm trying to record this show after five Guinnesses and two Desperados, well, let's call it two and a half Desperados now, those names, I think I've done a fairly good job of pronouncing them. Marcus Hilgilda is back on the tour this year. Uh, graduate from the Challenge Tour, done extremely well there. Thing that jumped out about him was how well he performed at the Bernardus Golf, which is a Cal Phillips design track. Um, he's now obviously stepping up to be on the DP World Tour full-time this year. I think he's got lots and lots of pedigree. From a statistical point of view, I need to see more recorded rounds before I can sort of make a, a thorough judgment on how well he grades out in a field like this. But in terms of sort of the narrative fit, if you like, and the, the what he's showing on Kyle Phillips, um, if he can replicate what he did on the first two days in that competition, that's definitely one that I think could go fairly well here 6,900 Jazz Jana Watanon 6,900 I'll be perfectly honest with you I just know that Jazz played last week uh, he's got the competitive rounds and it's probably a fairly nice price point to get in with someone that is coming here not rusty and has that bit of an edge so that's one that I've factored in Joachim Lagerin as well 6,800 again done well at some Kyle Phillips uh, tracks that certainly stood out and has a bit of composure about him, the putting, the, the accuracy side of things. So Joachim Lagerin is another one that I'm going to have a look at. The best bet then, and so I'm going to the top of the board for the best bet this week. It's Colin Morikawa over Rory McIlroy. To be honest, I touched upon Sam Horsfield and Victor Hovland. They're two golfers that I am going to look to fade. I'm hoping that when I look on Wednesday morning, I'm going to see some more matchups priced up, generally speaking, for those guys and see if we can get on to someone that I want to back. But the top of the board then, I can't, I, I cannot get away with Colin Morikawa. I can't get away from him. Rory, my homeboy uh, from Hollywood in Northern Ireland. Listen, there'll be plenty of times this year that I'll be on Rory McIlroy, both on the PGA Tour, majors, everything else to go with it. Uh, this week at minus 115 with DK Sportsbook, the, the price really jumped out. I have Morikawa ahead in a number of the different categories that I was looking at in particular, so I definitely have to keep that in mind. Listen, guys, I have put a show together. I don't know what it's going to come across like on podcast form. I don't know what it's going to come across like on the YouTube side of things. I'd say when I look back tomorrow and I look at my eyes and I go, how the hell did you get that put together? But it's in the books. We're going to drop all my notes into the Not Hot. You can join me there. Uh, if you didn't catch Garth Simmons' show last week as well on the Corn Ferry Tour, do you know what? I'm actually going to do, take a live moment here because the last time I looked after round two, 
one of Garrett's picks was doing extremely well. So let me just see how he's faring now. This is this is great on pre-record, but let me have a look. Listen, I I have to hand it to the kid. We're just going to call him the kid on the Tour Junkies Network. So looking heading into the final round, we have Chris Baker T5 along with Aske Batia. So that's two selections that Garrett Simmons delivered on his debut show this week and listen you got to ask for nothing more than being in contention going down the stretch into round four so if you didn't catch that definitely do the boys have also recorded their uh preview show for the amex this week that's well worth a listen as well special guest too so lots of content coming on the tour junkies network this year i'm mark hill i am going to sleep i'm going to bed and i have to get back up for office meetings in the morning at 9 a.m and hope that i can actually make them so cheers fellas good luck and that is tonight's show in the bag